four months ago I started putting this big contraption together. This is a scanning electron microscope and I've been wanting to build this thing forever. Applied Science made a video on YouTube like 15 years ago and he made his own. And when I first saw that someone could make something like this on their own at home, I was like perplexed. I went, I put my headphones on, I went for a walk, the music was like blasting and it made me feel so ambitious inside that I just knew that I was like, I'm gonna have to put everything into this. I was in the Marines then, I really couldn't start building this in the barracks, so I actually did, I, I did start building in the barracks. Um, but then I got out and I got home and just this last August, I started putting this thing together, finally, like really putting it together. And it's over the past four, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying four months this thing has really come together. It's not done yet. It's got, I don't know, probably three, four months left until it's actually running. The electronics, they're gonna be a beast to tackle. I've got most of them done, most of it planned, but here's where we're at so far. So this is the main frame, and this is the actual microscope. This is basically a vacuum chamber with a chassis, right? You need a vacuum chamber for an electron microscope because we're using, instead of light, we're using electrons. We're using a beam of electrons, and those electrons they don't want to bump into anything. So we effectively need nothing in the way. And that's why I've got two pumps for this thing. I've got a regular pump, just a mechanical vacuum pump. And you could imagine that I was dumping out a water bottle and there was still some little driplets on the wall. And that's why I have a second pump, a turbo molecular pump, which is like a jet engine. And it spins at 90,000 RPM. It creates a massive pressure differential and just sucks those things just right out of the chip, you know, but it's, there's still some stuff in there. You just can't get it perfect, right? There's like helium and stuff bouncing around on the walls. You don't want any of that, but there's plenty of that. But I get it down to like 10, 200, maybe even a millionth of atmospheric pressure. And then we can start spraying electrons at the sample. So what happens is, is I get like a tungsten filament, just like you'd have in a light bulb. And this is very similar to how a light bulb works, kind of, right? So you've got this tungsten filament and you heat it up really hot, like a couple thousand degrees. And then the electrons, they start to like bubble off. Now on a light bulb, there's this white coating and it's phosphor, right? When the electrons are bubbling off, they're bumping into that phosphor and making more light. If you were to look at a light bulb, if you take a light bulb that doesn't have the phosphor, it's not very bright, but you put that white on there, it's real bright. So basically what happens is in this microscope, I've got my electrons and they're, they're just tunneling down, right? But they've got no direction, so I use electric fields to focus them to tiny spots, right? And I make a focal point at the very, like right before I get down to the nitty gritty, like where the sample is. And I've got these scan plates like halfway through. Now these scan plates are scanning it in the X and the Y directions. So I, that's why it's called a scanning electron microscope. Now, what I want to do is scan them in predictable spots. I know in the same spot on this X and Y coordinate plane here. And when they're hitting that spot, electrons, because it's a rest and these electrons are moving so fast, they're like scattering off the surface and I collect them with this little cage that's got a voltage on it. And this whole detector system, I've got it right here. It's called an Everhart Thornley detector. Now those, it's, there's kind of a low, it's a high voltage, but relatively low compared to the rest of this thing. It's like 300 volts on this cage. And so it's not gonna have enough energy there to attract like the highest energy electrons that are getting scattered off because those are X-rays and they don't mean nothing to us. We want the lower energy ones that are gonna give us topographical information about the sample surface. So I'm collecting those with that cage and then they're getting attracted and when they get there, then they get like really pulled in because I put 10 kilovolts on this phosphor, just like I mentioned earlier, 10 kilovolts. I really don't need any current. So it's just like not that important like to have a regulated power supply on that thing but there's a lot of voltage there. So when an electron hits that, there's a ton of energy that comes off and it gets released as light photons, right? They come off the surface, just like in a light bulb. What happens then is that they travel through just a light guide, which is just a piece of acrylic. Uh, and then it goes into the photo multiplier, which is on the outside, right? Now this photo multiplier just has a very, very thin metal plate on it. And Einstein in 1915 discovered the photoelectric effect. When photons hit a piece of metal, electrons come off. When electrons hit a piece of metal, photons come off. Well, these electrons come off at the other side in the photomultiplier, and there's 10 like cascading plates with a, about 100 volts higher than the last um, on each plate. So these electrons hit the plate, and it just gets like amplified by about a million times for my case right here. So 
what started at like about 50 electron volts, very low energy electrons, um, is now like still pretty low. It's like in the micro microamps, right? I get a current pulse out of that. That current pulse, I'll use a trans impedance amplifier. Sorry for getting too Star Trek, Star Wars on you here. Well, I'll use that to turn that into like a voltage pulse. And that voltage pulse is mapped with the X and Y coordinate system that I was just talking about earlier with the scanning plates. So it's like, okay, I measured here, all that magic happened right here, and I got this many volts out of that. And so I'll take that, and that's going to be the brightness of the pixel that I'm plotting on this screen right here. Now, in reality, there's a lot of like logic that has to happen till it can actually go there. And the biggest problem with this thing is that I'm using a VGA screen, Video Graphics Array, which is 40 megahertz. And I'm measuring this thing at like a couple kilohertz. So I got to measure it really slow. And then I got to, you know, like <laughs> display it really fast. Well, that's kind of a problem because there's a couple of reasons why it's a problem. But I'm actually handling it. I got a plan for it. It's in the works right now. Got a big circuit board that I'm building for it. I'll show it to you right now. So this right here handles all the scan positioning and that stuff right there. It's not complete yet. As you can see, I got really meticulous with the wiring like that. That's just how I am. You know, I just like it's the only way to do it for me. Um, that board is most of the way completed and it's got some auxiliary boards like this one here too. Uh, this is gonna handle the actual position of the, like where I'm scanning. So I can move, I've got, you know, like this is my screen, what's gonna be on the screen, right? I can move this as well, right? I can do it analog with the actual amplifier and then I can do it with that circuit as well. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of reasons why I want to do everything digitally because then I can like, I can keep track of any inaccuracies that are happening. I can really like itemize everything in the microscope and get like the most predictable performance out of it. As well, I, where else? What else? I mean, yeah, there's a bunch else, but, um, this vacuum chamber, I'll, I'll call, we'll talk about that. It's all made out of conflat parts, um, which are so expensive for, you know, good reason. They're pretty good. Uh, but also the gaskets are expensive. Now, the reason I got it like this is because I knew that it's going to have the most modularity. I'm going to be able to find conflat parts. I mean, applied science, you use a big bell jar. But for me, like, like I like to do my circuits like this. I also like to do meat work. Like, I just wanted it to be perfect, you know. And also, it looks pretty cool. Like, I like these bolts around here. It just, it's, it looks good to me. It's just expensive. And then, yeah, you know, adds a lot of time. Uh most of this thing is made out of aluminum extrusions. I went to the scrap yard and they just had a bunch of aluminum extrusions. I got all these extrusions. There's probably like a hundred feet of extrusions here. I paid like 30 bucks for it. I got really lucky there. I even got some con flat parts on Facebook marketplace for like really cheap. Actually get a load of this, get a load of this. So I got this whole chamber with everything on it. It was listed for $2,500, but it was waterlogged. So I talked the guy down to 250 bucks. Another thing about this microscope is you have to isolate the turbo molecular pump from the roughing pump. And so how I did that is with these, this is, you know, a pneumatic controller. So these have some solenoid valves that get connected to an air compressor. And then there's actually these pneumatic vacuum valves, which are in the back. I got them for like 20 bucks a piece on eBay. Um, that is isolating those pumps. And you need to do that because like I said earlier, that turbo pump spins at 90,000 RPM. It'll just burn up. You don't want that to happen. Um, to measure the vacuum level, uh, there's two pumps. So I got a Pirani gauge back here. Uh, and then here, this is a vacuum ionization gauge. Now, usually, now this is, it's like, it's kind of hard to see here. It's like a glass ampule. This is like one of the coolest looking contraptions that I have in my shop. I love this thing. It's actually called a, a Bayard Alpert nude ion gauge. <laughs> if if you want to pull that one out. Um, that, would it, it's, it's like a, like a tube like that you would have in an old guitar amplifier and that measures the current because there's going to be less things bumping into the electrons traveling across and you're like oh well i know that's 10 to the negative 9 tor because there's like this many electrons that's what that that's what the electronics in there are doing okay so and then you got your pirani gauge which has like a, a little heating element and a resistor and depending on the resistance of that resistor uh it'll tell us like how much heat can con conduct across the vacuum and you'll know the pressure because of that um so you need two different pumps because that's only effective, like once you get to a low enough vacuum, there's just no way for the heat to get across anymore. And so then you need the new ion gauge because, you know, you just got to have them. That goes down to 10 to the negative 13 tor. Uh, and then the piranha gauge goes, goes down to like 10 to the negative three. It's like, 
get out of here, dude. You got nothing on the Bayard Alpert nude ion gauge. Get a load of that, right? It's a mouthful. Well, I got really lucky with some of these parts. Like this right here, this little... I, I would not want to go onto KurtJLesker.com and pay $1,500 for this thing. So I was just like, look, there are some people that stock people, but I stock things on eBay. And that's when I found this guy for $150. Get a load of that. I was a happy sailor, you know? So we also got here, we got some vent valves right there. Uh, this right here is just another automatic one. That's just there for, you know, might need it. Oh, this. So this is made out of glass and I've got that photo multiplier in there and I don't want like light getting in because that'll just pollute my signal. So this is just another valve and I just close this and that way no daylight's getting into my microscope. And I got, I got, I got a window there. So it's kind of like, what are you talking about, dude? Well, you gotta, I'll, I'll figure out a way to cover that thing up because also x-rays are going to be coming out and I kind of don't want to turn it into a skeleton. Uh, this right here, this, you can't, let me, let me show you here. Get a load of this guy right here. So this is, I don't even, I don't even know it off the top of my head. This is a, okay, it's a 20 kilovolt BNC connector. At first I thought it was an SHV or an NHV because those are like 10 kilovolts. So I bought like the cable for it, which was not cheap. And then it didn't fit. And I was like, well, what, what could it be then? Well, it turns out there's a 20 kilovolt version and it's bigger. And it's just a trillion times more. Like I think the K, I, I saw cable for like, like $560. I ain't paint that. That's not gonna happen. So I just basically stuck a wire in there and called it good. Uh, it'll, you know, if it looks nice, then I'm happy with it. Um, there's a lot more. I think I'll cover it in another video because it's gonna have a lot to do with the mainframe here and that's not done and there's a lot to be said about it. So that's that.